Cleary presents a unique look at Northwest Arkansas with music, interviews, drama, and personalities. And now, here's Mike. Hello, I'm Mike Cleary, and welcome to Mike Cleary Presents. Revenge, retaliation, retribution. These frailties of the human condition have been exemplified in literary characters from the times of Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey right up through the fictional characters of the 23rd century. Characters who, in their uncontrollable and unquenchable lust for vengeance, must pursue their quarry until the inevitable final conflict where their ultimate fates shall be decided. Few characters personify this compulsive obsession in classic literature more than human Melville's Captain Ahab in the book Moby Dick. Melville's Ahab feels that he must persist in his destined course of following the object of his hatred. In this case, the white whale Moby Dick, even against the constant pleading of his crew to abandon what Ahab's first mate, Mr. Starbuck, calls madness. Moby Dick seeks thee not, Starbuck pleads. It is thou, thou, that madly seekest him. Indeed, Captain Ahab credits powers greater than himself as the guiding force of his compulsion. I am the fate's lieutenant, Ahab says. I act under orders. This course of action eventually leads Ahab to the destruction of both himself and those sailors aboard the ill-fated Pequod. Examples of this extraordinary behavior continue to be found in modern fiction, as we see in the title character of the film Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Khan must chase the object of his hatred. In this case, the Starship Enterprise and its captain, James Kirk, until Khan is proclaimed either the victor or the defeated. Both Khan and Ahab are totally consumed with hatred toward a singular object, and their quest for revenge leads them to a conflict where they must destroy the focus of their obsession or be destroyed themselves. Now, this parallel between the two characters and storylines is no accident, as we find in many examples throughout the film, Star Trek II, that allude to the unquestionable influence of Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Many hidden clues are placed within the film, and these are what folks refer to as Easter eggs. They're little hints tucked away in scenes that the audience may not notice unless they look very closely. Early in the movie, Commander Pavel Chekhov enters the derelict ship Botany Bay and actually spots a copy of Moby Dick sitting on a bookshelf. The book in the deserted ship is an ominous portent, a foreboding of the characterization and plot line to follow. This is no coincidence, for we see many parallels in both the characteristics of Khan, likened to Melville's Ahab, and in the course of events as this futuristic story unfolds. For example, Khan boasts 
of being a creature of superior intellect, trusting in his extraordinary intelligence to deliver victory to him over his quarry. Ahab also sees himself pitted against a supposedly lesser being, the white whale, referring to Moby Dick as a fish, denoting human superiority over animals of lower species. Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck, re-emphasizing Ahab's superior intellect over the whale, while making a plea to his captain's rationality to stop the insane pursuit. Khan is obsessed with revenge, even beyond the point of placing himself and his crew in peril. He must pursue the enterprise, symbolized as a great white entity, much like the whale Moby Dick, to the imminent destruction of himself and his ship. Even to the pleading of his crew to abandon the pursuit, he explains in Ahab's own words, he tasks me. Khan further demonstrates his murderous intentions by quoting Melville's Ahab again, saying, I'll chase him round perdition's flames before I give him up. Herman Melville captures the anger, frustration, and desire for retribution in Captain Ahab as a man who had been wronged by the object of his hatred. In this case, the white whale in taking off his leg. Khan, as we discover, was also wronged, having been stranded on a desolate desert planet for 15 years. He takes his revenge against Captain James Kirk as the one who placed him in that position. And the ship that Kirk commanded, the Enterprise, becomes Khan's white whale. Khan draws his craft into a final conflict with the Enterprise within the Motara Nebula, a swirling colonic vortex. This is seen to be similar to the final destruction of the Pequod, where the whaling ship succumbs to the swirling eddies of a whirlpool, which, quote, carried the smallest chip of the Pequod out of sight, unquote. All of Khan's crew perish in this final conquest, leaving no Ishmael to relate their story. An interesting visual correlation of the two stories takes place within the Motara Nebula, where the great white Leviathan of the Enterprise rises from below to deal the final death blow to Khan's ship. Compare this to the whale Moby Dick rising from the depths of the ocean to attack the crew of the Pequod. Another visual similarity found in the closing scenes of the film is a single coffin which is hurled through space to a new world, carrying with it possibly the chance to escape the jaws of death? Could this be a mere coincidence then, since the sole survivor of the Pequod, Ishmael, was found clinging to the lone coffin made life buoy of his friend Queequeg? With this symbolic representation of an object of death, supporting life so vividly illustrated in the book Moby Dick, perhaps the makers of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan wish to conclude their story with the same macabre message. In the final combat between Khan's ship and the Enterprise, Khan quotes directly from the novel citing the scene where Ahab engages the whale for the last time. Here, Ahab makes one last futile attempt to deal a death blow to the hated object, and Khan, 
epitomizes his wrath and fury by causing the destruction of his own ship in the hopes of obliterating the Enterprise along with him. Khan repeats Ahab's final words. To the last I grapple with thee. From hell's heart I stab at thee. For hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee. With these examples of dialogue, actions, and visual representations, we can see that the antagonistic personage of the vindictive Khan had been portrayed to express the embodiment of the motivations, fixations, and behavior of Melville's Captain Ahab. His quest for vengeance is the driving force which, like Ahab, dictate his actions even to the blindness of reason and the welfare of his crew. It's evident that the filmmakers of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, had fully intended that the character of Khan imitate Melville's Ahab, the obsessed captain bent on retribution and revenge. Check it out for yourself. Read Herman Melville's classic novel, Moby Dick. Then see Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and see if you can spot some more hidden Easter eggs. We'll be right back after these announcements. We'll be right back after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Mike Cleary Presents, and thank you for watching Bella Vista Community Television. On October 29th, 1998, astronaut John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth, returned to space at the age of 77 aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery, making him the oldest human being to venture into space. 77 years old, and he returned to outer space. Now there's a man who wouldn't let age get in the way of his dreams. You know, it's tough getting old. Graying hair, thinning hair, wrinkles, and your eyesight isn't as good as it was when you were younger. Several years ago, my vision began to get blurry and cloudy, and I went to the eye doctor and he told me that I had cataracts in both eyes and had to have surgery. Now, having surgery in your eyes is a rather daunting prospect, but he said that if I didn't address the problem soon, the condition would get worse. So, of course, I chose to have the procedure done. This was at a time when most cataract surgery involved replacing the lens in your eye with a solid artificial lens, kind of like hard contact lenses. The doctor told me that after the surgery, I still might have to wear glasses because the lenses were kind of a one size fits all and the results weren't perfect. However, there was a new procedure available that was in its experimental stages that we could try. It was a flexible replacement called crystal lens that acted more like your real lens in your eye. And I said, do it. And we went with the new version. My eyesight improved immensely. I no longer needed to wear glasses and my vision was so good I could read a newspaper from across the room. Since then, I've taken a mental note of many common expressions involving seeing and clear vision, such as, I see what you mean. He's a man of vision, and you're not seeing the whole picture. These expressions are not referring to 
eyesight and seeing clearly, but seeing with your mind. A person can have excellent vision and yet still not be seeing clearly. I can't tell you how many times I tried to convey a concept to someone and they just didn't get it. To me, it was perfectly clear, but they just didn't get it. They couldn't see the whole picture when I would ask, you see what I'm saying? Another aspect of getting older is gathering, we hope, <laughs> of wisdom and experience, as well as knowledge or book learning, as some folks might say. We gray-haired members of an older generation have been through a lot. We could tell you a thing or two about life. We've seen it all, as it were. But just because you've seen it doesn't mean you actually see it. I've attended theatrical productions and gone to movies that left me shaking my head saying, I don't get it. Having perfect vision doesn't mean that we always see what's being presented to us. My wife Sharon and I will watch a movie or a television program and come away with entirely different viewpoints about the message that we receive. We'll discuss it afterward and I'll say, I didn't notice that. Or she'll say, I didn't get that part. It's like several artists sketching the same model. Each one has their own impression of what they see and how they interpret it. No two people can stand in exactly the same spot at exactly the same time and see the same thing. Your experience depends on your perspective. And it's the same thing with life. Every person has their own viewpoint and their own opinion on what they've seen or heard or experienced. That doesn't make some folks right and others wrong. Each are seeing what they are able to see or are focusing on one aspect and sometimes not fully noticing the rest. There was a scene in the film Dead Poets Society where school teacher Robin Williams instructed his students to stand on top of their desks. This gave them an entirely different viewpoint of the classroom. And it's the same with people. Everyone has their own viewpoint depending on where they are. And the challenges that they had to face in order to get there. That doesn't make them right or wrong, just different. Try to see things through other people's eyes. Though you may not agree with their position on a particular subject, shift your vision to what they may be seeing. I may have better vision now than I had several years ago, but I have to admit I don't always see everything clearly. Sometimes they need others to explain to me what it is that they see. And perhaps together we can get a clearer picture of what's going on in our world. Well, I have a song about seeing with your eyes and seeing with your mind. <laughs> and it's called, What You See Is What You Get. If you focus your attention on what you do not have, the universe believes that's what you need. You draw to yourself what your mind dwells most upon, and you'll end up with more negativity. But if you think about abundance and all the blessings that you have, then your deepest needs will soon be met. What you deem to be important what your heart desires most. Well, that, my friend, is what you're going to get. What you see, what you see of your life, well, that's how it's going to be. The universe will provide what the heart holds tight inside and makes those desires reality. Oh, what you see, yes, what you see of your life, well that's how it's gonna be. It's the law of attraction, the cause and the reaction. Cause, my friend, what you get is what you see. Now if you focus on an illness, then your health will take a dive. 
When you're sad, those days of gloom will never fade. What your vision in your mind will manifest in time. The life you have is consciousness has made. Keep your heart centered in happiness and you'll get much more of that. More peace and love and joy, I guarantee. What you choose for yourself, you draw to yourself. What you get is exactly what you see. Oh, what you see is what you see of your life. Well, that's how it's going to be. The universe will provide what your heart holds tight inside. And makes those desires reality. Oh, what you see, yes, what you see of your life. Well, that's how it's going to be. It's the law of attraction, the cause and the reaction. Because, my friend, what you get is what you see. Yes, my friend, what you get is exactly what you see. Thank you for joining me for Mike Cleary Presents, and thank you for watching Bella Vista Community Television. We'll catch you next time. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us today. Watch our schedules for the next program or check us out on YouTube. This has been a presentation of Bella Vista Community Television.